Yeah. My name is Dr. Jerry Groot. I'm Senior Lecturer in Chinese Studies at the uh, Centre for Asian Studies at the University of Adelaide. And I'm going to talk about the recent change in leadership in China and what, it, what we need to bear in mind when we're reading about what might happen in the future. This uh, brief talk that I'm giving today is based on a, a lecture I gave at the Australian National University in December of 2012 for the Center for um, the Australian Center for China and the World, <clears throat> and it was about the problems of predicting what was going to happen in China based on our past experience and what we don't know. Uh, the Chinese leadership is of great importance to Australia and around the world for all sorts of reasons, and that's one of the, re the and that's a reason why there was so much interest in it in the lead up to the 18th Party Congress of the Chinese Communist Party, which was held in November of 2012. There was intense scrutiny of the potential candidates for the top positions. There was a lot of uh, concern about how many people would make it to the standing committee of the Politburo, that is the small group of leaders at the very top of the 82 million strong Communist Party which runs China and uh, there, who would be in it, how many there would be and what that would mean for reform. Now, where were we? as we now know Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang, together with five other uh, leading Communist Party officials, most of whom have very extensive experience at running provinces, all bar one in fact, have very extensive uh, on the ground experience in, in different parts of China and are also quite highly educated and outside of the narrow technocratic uh, bands that we've had in the past which consisted mainly of engineers. So in many ways this is a, a, a quite different leadership from the ones we had under Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao and prior to that under Jiang Zemin where engineers dominated. However, because they've got a different educational background does not mean we should assume that there is going to be a dramatic change in the way that they organize, control and run China. What we do know is that uh, both in November and then just in the last two weeks when we had the convening of the, uh, this year's National People's Congress which marked the transition of the party leadership to their positions in the government uh, equivalent uh, which, which is uh, important to realize because China, some people tend to forget that China is a party state one of the reasons there was so much emphasis on the lead up to the party congress was because whatever is decided at the party congress is much more important overall and for the next t five to ten years than what happens in the national people's congress because the party always trumps the government and in this case the, institu the top institution of government which is the, part of the national people's congress All the leaders have promised to go ahead with the reform, Xi Jinping and the, the new president and uh, general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party and his deputy uh, Li Keqiang who is now premier but most of his power comes from being his second in command uh, to Xi Jinping in the Communist Party. They and their and the rest of the Com Communist Party leadership have pledged to maintain policies which uh, give China a very high level of economic growth. They have pledged a war on corruption, which is an in, intriguing uh, change in wording about what their priority is in the struggle for against corruption, because corruption is now often seen as the single greatest systemic weakness of the Communist Party and really threatens its legitimacy at a number of levels. And they've promised to attack the problems underlying the 
increasingly serious and obvious and unavoidable environmental degradation that's all around them. For example, when the National Party Congress was being held and the, and the 18th Party Congress, the pollution in Beijing was at unprecedented levels. Not only that, but there are all sorts of uh, problems with water quality, water shortages, uh, soil uh, degradation, desertification, etc. And these are becoming very, very obvious problems uh, and ma manifesting themselves in very uh, obvious and symbolic ways, such as huge dust storms over the capital cities and so forth, and are even reaching uh, Japan, Korea, and even America. So all these, for all these issues, it's very important that we know what's uh, happening in China. This talk is not really a prediction because as an academic who's a little bit interested in this topic of predicting and predicting in the case of China, I know that academics record uh, records in predicting is woeful and most predictions that you see are simple straight line projections of existing trends and fail to take into account adequate levels of complexity and in the case of China we know that everything is very complex and well, if for no other reason then China is a very big place with 1.3 billion people across 30 or more different provinces with all sorts of uh, complicated uh, issues at work in each one of those so the room for error of course is always strong uh, those who have predicted China's demise on the other hand have been many and varied and Gordon Chang's most famously in 1999 with the coming collapse of China but that hasn't happened either and so the failure of prediction is a, is a major issue we should always treat predictions with uh, skepticism but on the other hand we have to realize that we have no choice but to try to predict what might happen or what is likely to happen because without a plan we plan to fail. I'd just like to raise three points for anybody watching this to bear in mind when thinking about China. The first one I've already discussed in, in some depth and that is just be very wary about predictions because there is always a possibility that anything that can go wrong or could go wrong will go wrong. Of course such events are rare but as Nicholas Taleb showed us in his book The Black Swan because they are rare doesn't mean that they will never happen it means that they happen rarely but when they do happen the consequences were not foreseen and are very hard to deal with and the legacy of those problems is often quite uh, immense. The other problem I'd like to raise is the uh, one which has bedeviled what the watching of China over the last hundred years or even, even longer and that is the projection into Chinese words the hopes and aspirations of those who were who were looking and read, looking at them and reading them. This, is, this problem goes all the way back to when Christian missionaries were looking at the works of Confucius and reading into them for proof that Confucius somehow embodied Christian values and their affirmation as a result of their wish to find con Christian values in Confucianism was that they did indeed find them and whether that was really the case or not the way that they interpret that has bedeviled the way that we've looked at China ever since. And the same principle applies at the moment. The Communist Party is facing a tremendous uh, set of problems to do with the way the uh, planned economy of the previous era under Mao from 1949 until 1976 is now uh, being drastically changed by the advent of a market economy, by the inflow of foreign investment by the creation of foreign funded uh, adventures by the fact that the state-owned enterprises in many cases have been stripped down to a, a small number but of increasing importance that parts of the economy are closed to outsiders 
and controlled by the state for strategic purposes that China itself now has a thriving number of, mil of millions of young entrepreneurs uh, who are in some cases restrained and controlled by the effects of the state-owned enterprises and the way that China is now so much more open to the world than it has ever been in its, in its history. So the result of that really dramatic change when you lay over that, that change, the fact that the political institutions have changed very little, that the other key institutions that deal with a complex society, such as the bureaucracies, such as the legal system, have also changed very little, or they have not changed enough to catch up with the other changes all around them, as well as the fact that Chinese society has changed very, very dramatically in the last 30 years. And it had undergone a very dramatic change before that too, of course. So the legacy of those complexities and the contradictions between the changes at the one level and the lack of change at the institutional level are the ones that the present leadership has pledged to reform. And it's that word reform which is the word which I want to uh, alert you to and remind you that when you think about China, that when people say reform, we should read it in terms of reform from what the Chinese Communist Party and its leaders and representatives say. Because the problem which has bedeviled this analysis in recent times has been the projection into the word reform all sorts of connotations and aspirations and uh, hopes and dreams and wishes of Anglophone analysts and watchers in particular. These Anglophone observers have a very strong tendency to take their own values, uh, democracy, rule of law, separation of powers, all those sorts of uh, things and project them into whatever the, is talked about in China in terms of reform. And just as it led to problems reading Confucius, just as it led to a misunderstanding of the nature of the Communist Party in the 1940s, just as it led to a misunderstanding of minor parties and groups and so-called liberals in China in the, in the late 40s and during the Civil War, so today that notion that somehow reform means that China will become more like us is almost certainly misplaced because the imperatives behind it in China, from a Chinese point of view, are quite different. My last point is that having already uh, spoken about the caveats on predicting, based on the normal standard of prediction, which is to look into the recent past and project it into a straight line into the future, we would have to say that on that basis the success of reform in China has been underestimated by the vast majority of observers and the potential for disaster has always been overstated even if the reasons for pessimism often still remain the Communist Party and its leadership has often been extremely good at negotiating the changes necessary to prevent those problems becoming a disaster. Thank you. <laughs>